Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. Want to improve your organization's customer service? Looking for insider tips to knock your customer socks off? Then you're in the right place. Here's your host, Yannick Grant. Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. On today's episode, our guest is Randy Mercer. Randy is an omnichannel product content expert with over 15 years of industry experience. He leads One World Sync's global product management and solution architecture teams, aligning the company's portfolio with current customer needs and emerging market trends. A frequent commentator for national and trade media outlets covering retail and e-commerce news, Randy leverages his extensive background in item and data content alignment, e-commerce application development, and solution design to guide One World Sync's strategic product roadmap and vision. So without further delay, sit back, plug your earphones in, and let's jump right into this conversation with Randy. Welcome, Randy. Hello. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Now, could you share with our listeners a little bit about your journey, how it is that you got from where you are, from where you're coming from to where you are today? Uh, sh- sure. Yeah. So I started out as a as an uh, application developer uh, about 20 years ago, and through that, doing some customer d- development for a few customers found myself developing applications for the space that I'm in today, which is product content and uh, sharing and distribution of that content. And fast forward uh, about two decades, um, I've now been with uh, with One World Sync for uh, about 10 years and have been leading the product organization for about the last uh, five or so of that. All right. And could you tell our audience a little bit about One World Sync, what it is that your organization does? Sure. We're a SaaS platform that sits predominantly in the in the retail space and uh, we sit between large manufacturers um, cpg manufacturers primarily and large retail organizations um, uh, many of, of of which you you would know and we allow those organizations to share master data and ecom content back and forth between the two organizations to power pretty much any any channel all right so you're in that digital space. I was reading something that Shep Hyken sent out recently about the different acronyms that you have now. You have EX, CX, WX, UX, and he was kind of giving a breakdown in his newsletter as to the different user experiences that exist and what the acronyms represent. Just thinking about the different experiences that the customer has, based on your experience and your area, you know, um, what I picked up from your bio was you focus a lot on the landscape and the architecture of the experience. What are some key things that if we had a listener um, tapping into this podcast who was in that similar space looking to strengthen the architecture of their user experience, um, whether it be the digital, the web, or even the face-to-face, or even through the contact center that you believe they should be focused on primarily um, at this time? Yeah, you know, when, when we look at our our customer base and our target market you know what we what we're primarily helping them with is the consumer experience uh, associated with um with ecom uh, primarily but we also extend that into the in-store experience uh, as well so uh, we're often very focused on for them the consistency between the in-store experience and the and the the ecom um experience in terms of the content that they're be, that they're using to power um, power all of that, um, so a very consistent product representation across all of the channels, uh, to include the imagery, the uh, the search engine optimized copy, rich media in the terms of videos, AR, VR, all of those things. But aside from all of that, um, when you think of of um, just how all of that comes to be uh, something that we help our customers with a lot is what we describe as orchestrating uh, the content or the consumer experience, right? How do you get from creating content, managing it, distributing it into the marketplace, and then monitoring how it's selling for you? All the things that go into orchestrating uh, those behaviors and those activities is uh, just secondarily something that we help our customers with a lot. All right. Now, in your space, your business and what you're doing, what have been some maybe one or two emerging market trends that you've seen in the whole customer experience space? Um, Not just necessarily from a face to face interaction, but even digital, seeing that that's a a lot. uh, Many customers, that's where they hang out. It's easier for them. The convenience is better and it's less hassle for them. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing that we recognize today is just the expectations of the consumer that's shopping online in terms of the types of information and the types of content that they're expecting to see uh, when they uh, when they're doing their shopping on any e-com site. Beyond that, I just mentioned, you know, the consistency related to that. What we know in, in the consumer surveys that we do is that consumers today are they're not just shopping on one one site. They're often looking at items across a number of different digital properties before they finally make a, a buying decision. And they're looking for more and more content. So one of the expectations that we see evolving is just this expectation of, of consistency across these digital channels. And if they don't see that, it just it damages the trust they might have in the information they're seeing, right? If it's not the same, like which one of them is correct? And then sometimes they just move on to the, uh, you know, to other products and things like that. So the other thing that we see uh, evolving around the, the online consumer experience is the fact that uh, consumers don't like to read, right? They like to look at pictures. So <laughs> when we help our, uh, our customers with the imagery that they use to de depict their products more and more, um, we're starting to create imagery that that contains some of the verbiage that um, that is actually in the SEO copy. But again, consumers don't often read that. They're just looking at the pictures. So annotated images becoming more and more, um, more and more frequent hotspot images, right, where they've got, you know, spots on the images where you can click and pull up some specific details. And then hero imagery, right, where we take a, a front facing product image and we call out a few very key details about that product as a way of just in, informing the consumer without them having to read uh, some of the text. Right. So you kind of have to find a way to make the information pop, making it uh, less frustrating for them to try and dig through your, your website to try and find what they're looking for, but it kind of just, it's there. You mentioned expectations and consistency, and I quite agree with you as it relates to both. I find a lot of organizations, it's not that they don't deliver a great experience or maybe that's, you know, their intention is to give a, a great experience, but the challenge is that they don't, they don't do it consistently. Could you share with our listeners based on your experience, especially from a design perspective, what are some key things that you need to consider in order to ensure or, or you know, at least to get as close to ensuring, because I know nothing in life is guaranteed, to get closer to being consistent? Yeah, you know, it is it is just attention to detail. So within our platform that allows the 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 manufacturers uh, to to manage um, and prepare their data to be sharing that with the marketplace, we just provide a lot of tools that help them with the finer points of the content. A really good example of that is, uh, you know, a significant percentage of our customers are in the the food CPG space, right? So selling food products into in through retail channel. And today, in the area of transparency and an intense interest in nutritionals, allergens, those kinds of things is related to food, key to all of that is, is the, the nutrition fact panel that you often see represented on the back of food packaging being represented digitally online. If that is not absolutely consistent with the package itself, and then maybe other digital representations of that you're very quickly going to damage the consumer's trust in that particular product is related to, you know, what they're putting in their body or feeding to their family. So we provide a lot of things, a lot of tools to help ensure that consistency all the way down to the point that we'll assemble that information on behalf uh, of the brand, um, you know, driven by imagery of the packaging. And we use, uh, you know, OCR, so so optical scanning and some AI to to digitize that information. So just an example, that's just a really key one in, in our space. Beyond that, you know, it just always goes back to the imagery. That's the first thing that consumers are looking at when they look at a product online mm -hmm. on any di digital channel is that imagery. So the degree to which you can distribute that all from one point of origination, which in, for our customers oftentimes is our platform, the better chance you stand of having it uh, consistent across the digital channels that you're trying to sell that product on. Right. And of course, the consistency leads to trust, because if you're consistent, then you become a brand that they trust. And if the trust factor is there, then they're more likely to continue purchasing from you. You also mentioned at the beginning the expectations. And I find a lot of times that there is a big disconnect between what is advertised and marketed. And of course, that's what sets up the expectations of the client and then what a client actually receives. 
Um, what has been your experience in trying to ensure that there is a, as, as close an alignment as possible between customer expectations and what is actually communicated by the brand? Yeah, that's, that is a, a, a really good question. And it's something that we talk about a, a lot. And when we on the on the retail or the e-tail side, you know, we talk to those those customers about making sure they're not manufacturing returns, right? And you can manufacture a return by doing exactly what you just described, misrepresenting the product online. Somebody buys it, they think they're getting one thing, and they get it and it's not exactly what they thought they were buying. And so they return it. Mm-hmm. And then as a as the Etailer, you're in a worse position than if you had not even sold the thing in the first place, right? Because you're <laughs> dealing with the expense of that return. So we, again, when we work with our brands relative to how they can uh, provide the best content out into the marketplace to represent their products online, oftentimes, uh, for some of them, that we're encouraging to, them to just let us do it, right? Ship the product to us. Um, we'll take the imagery of the product, we'll drive the product information. And that way we know when it leaves our platform out into whatever retailer or retailer is going to use that content, we're confident that it's that it's absolutely represent, representative of the product itself. That said, we never do that without the brand sign off on it, right? We give them the chance to say, yep, that accurately represents my product. But uh, in as opposed to just letting the brand provide some content that we don't really have visibility to the origination of that, um, it's just easier often if we just do it on behalf of the brand, you know, to just make sure it's absolutely representative of the product. All right. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Now, Randy, could you share with our listeners as well? What's the one online resource tool, website or app that you absolutely can't live without in your business? In, in our business? Mm hmm. Um, you know, we use a lot of tools that that provide um, uh, digital read only representations of product data that we assemble from a lot of different sources. And often we're using AI to do that. So draw on a, a number of sources within our applications, create that representation as a way to visually represent the item as it will be in, in e-com. Um, so in our case, it's a, you know, we use we uh, use an application within our enterprise called Digital Catalog. And it's, you know, literally what it says. And that's just the primary mechanism we have to cross check. Um, what is a product going to look like when you actually do publish it online across I- any channel? So that's a key one right there. All right. Great. Could you also share with our listeners maybe one or two books that have had a great impact on you? It could be a book that you read a very long time ago or even one that you've read recently. Oh, man, I tend to I tend to um, read a lot of books about product management. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, most recently, can't remember the titles, but, you know, two of them are the most recent ones are just around the evolution of product management and, you know, how how folks think about um, about doing that today in ways different than they used to. And what I mean by that is, you know, in, in at one time it was very driven around uh, the expectations of specific customers and trying to drive your products based on. Um, maybe some some expectations that may not be pervasive to to your entire community. And today we think about it a lot more from a pragmatic perspective. In fact, pragmatic uh, marketing is one of those uh, one of those areas of materials that we uh, leverage in in our product management practice. And the net of all of that is, you know, think very pragmatically about you know the solutions that you're that you're developing or or the products that you're managing in a way that they're it's the, the solutions you're providing are pervasive to your customer community. It's something that they're willing to pay for because you're solving a valuable problem for them. So I think pragmatic mar- or pragmatic marketing is probably one of the you know most recent things that uh, I can refer to. All right. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Now, could you also share with our listeners, what's the one thing that's going on in your life right now that you're really excited about? Either something you're working on to develop yourself or your people. Yeah, for me, in in our organization specifically, we've acquired a few technology platforms over the last uh, uh, two or three years. That the the fun part of that is not only have ag- having access to some additional technology to add to your uh, solution portfolio, um, but just the opportunity that you have to work with just just brand new sets of 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 people. Um, that come along with, you know, whatever platform you might uh, acquire 
And what we always find is, in addition to the value of the technology itself, it's the value of the people that, that comes along with it, right? So just new skill sets, new personalities, new energy. So for me, I'm, I'm literally on the road right now just visiting one of our recently acquired organizations. And it's just, it's, it's just very exciting to me uh, to just have that new experience and uh, bring new people into the organization and you, know, you get a lot of new perspectives. And uh, so for me, that's, uh, that's top of mind. All right. Awesome. Now, before we wrap our episodes up, we always like to ask our guests, do you have a quote or a saying that during times of adversity or challenge, you'll tend to revert to this quote? If for any reason you get derailed, it kind of helps to get you back on track. Yeah, I just used it earlier today. And it sounds <laughs> it might sound kind of negative when I when I when I say it. But, you know, I always say don't don't come with problems, come with solutions. Right. And and it, it's just it's just so often. Uh, that you know, folks want to um, want to um, expose or draw attention to an issue without much forethought to what you can do about it. And just the the approach that I just try to encourage is, you know, if you, if you see if you see an issue or some friction within uh, either the organization or maybe something that we're trying to do, you know, think through it first. How can you solve that problem? And then and then that's what you bring forward. And that's what you shed light on uh, versus just the, the the issue itself. So I always tend to draw back on that even with myself, right? Because the knee jerk reaction is to just moan and groan about something that isn't working quite the way you want it to. And I just have to remind myself, you know, think about it first and find the solution. And then that makes uh, the rest of it much easier to deal with. All right. Awesome. So we will definitely have that in the show notes of this episode. All right, Randy. Well, thank you so much for coming on our podcast today and sharing all of these great insights as it relates to your organization and your expertise and also some of the things that organizations can consider as it relates to consistency and expectations when they're trying to design a landscape for customers across the different channels that they're serving them to ensure that they have a delightful and a fantastic experience. I'm sure our listeners gain great insights from the information you shared with us today. Thank you so much. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Just want to remind our listeners that you can follow us on Twitter at NavigatingCX. And feel free to join our private Facebook group, Navigating the Customer Experience Community. Until next time, I'm your host, Yannick Grant. Thanks for listening. For more awesome resources to take your customer service game to another level, head over to navigatingthecustomerexperience.com. See you next time.